Uh, he's at an airport with a cat. Okay, that, that sounds... Wow. You know, I better check on him. Big season finale right there, you know? Better, uh, better go right now. Also, I told you not to get a dragon, Morty. This is your fault. F*** you. Worst adventure Worst ever. Worst adventure ever. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This is going to be my Rick and Morty Season 4, Episode 4 video. Does anybody know how long it takes a dragon to fly to Florida? There were a whole bunch of Easter eggs. We'll break it all down. If you're new to the channel, I'm doing videos for all the episodes this season. Be sure to subscribe to get everything. There's also a new merch giveaway, too. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave your favorite moment from the episode on the video. Careful for spoilers. If you have not seen the episode yet, we'll start with Top 10 WTF and Easter eggs as we go along. Starting with number 10, the title of the episode, Claw and Hoarder Special Victims Morty, a reference to Law and Order Special Victims Unit. If you don't remember, that's the TV show that Ice-T has been on for a billion years. He was also the subject of Water Tea during Get Swifty. Apparently now, he's actually a really big fan of Rick and Morty, so maybe he'll come back and guest star as a different character at some point. But the episode itself was mostly a parody of Dungeons and Dragons and pretty much every dragon trope you've ever heard of from every dragon TV show or movie. But number 9, R.I.P. Chachi in the cold open. They do the same type of cold open bit that they did during season 3 episode 6 where they go on this adventure that seems like it's supposed to be this really quick thing but Morty implies he's been in this alien prison for a long time so apparently this adventure has gone on much longer than what it seems like at the beginning of the episode. Rick sends Morty on a mission to get an ultimate cube, he gets captured, thrown in alien prison, Chachi helps him escape. They imply that they have all this history that they developed over the course of this adventure and then he just gets gunned down immediately and they use it as a way to show you how self-centered Rick is, that he would put Morty through something like this and then totally not care about Chachi, and once Morty produces the ultimate cube, Rick just immediately doesn't care about it because it's purple like the one that he already has. They also use the cold open to show you Morty being more assertive, recognize how much Rick is being a dick, demanding that he get his dragon. It's just part of the general progression of the Morty character, slowly and slowly becoming more assertive and sure of himself. The funny thing about that though, they pay it off at the end of the episode, is that even though he is becoming more assertive and sure of himself, his ideas aren't getting better. Worst adventure ever, Morty, as they all run off in different directions. Even though we learned this in last week's episode, Rick reminds us that he's familiar with Marvel Comics because he offers to give him Wolverine Claws. During last week's episode, he made the Doctor Strange joke rip off Doctor Strange, so he has seen the Marvel movies. The bit about nerds refusing to admit that they're Christian, being into dragons, I think is mostly a general dig at the paradox of being a nerd who's into fantasy but also science fiction, two genres that are typically in opposition to each other in the way they explain how things work. Bringing it back around to the Doctor Strange movie, that movie attempted to explain magic in a scientific way, and Dan Harmon consulted on the Doctor Strange movie, punching up their script in some places to help them explain some really complicated scenes in really simple ways. They said that the reason why he was brought onto the Doctor Strange movie is because of the Rick and Morty stuff. Because the Marvel people that make those movies like Rick and Morty because they're able to explain very complicated concepts in very simple ways. The whole bit with Rick accidentally gassing himself while trying to get Morty to shut up and then just landing himself in the hospital with all those injuries is just to pour salt on the wound, reminding you that he's no longer head of the family like he was during season 3, where Beth walks in and says, Did you actually promise Morty a dragon? Yeah, you have to live up to that promise. Number 8, Morty gets his dragon. Dan Harmon is voicing the wizard who controls all the dragons and executes the soul bond contract with Morty. The soul bond itself is a combination of references and easter eggs for a bunch of different dragon based movies and TV shows. Like when Rick is shown being hurt because the wizard is hurting the dragon or when Summer shoots the dragon in the eye, that's a reference to the movie Dragon Heart with Sean Connery. The dragon in that movie gives a human half of its heart linking them so when you hurt one you hurt the other. But the soul bond is a reference to dragon bonding, something that shows up in a bunch of different TV shows and movies. The very overt sexual jokes that they laid on top of this though made me think more of the Anne McCaffrey Dragon Riders of Pern series. If you've never read that, there's this intense psychic bond between dragons and their riders that forms, and when two dragons go into heat, so to speak, and start mating, the psychic feedback loop that it causes with their riders forces the riders of the different dragons that are mating to mate themselves, sometimes involuntarily. Like Morty didn't want to have anything to do with their creepy group soul bond session, but he has to anyway. Just another thing that Rick will probably have to erase from his mind. Jerry's Mind Blowers 2 got a big callback at the end of the episode. But if you watched Game of Thrones, you also know that dragon bonding is something that's common to that series of people of Valyrian descent like the Targaryen family. But it's not quite as intense during the Song of Ice and Fire series as it is during the Anne McCaffrey book series. 
A lot of all these magic tropes and jokes reminded me of Dan Harmon's Harmon Quest, which is also his ongoing Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game that he turned into a web show. We also meet Balthramar the Dragon, played by Liam Cunningham from Game of Thrones, Sir Davos himself, finally playing a dragon. They keep referring to the dragons like cats, and then there's the separate talking cat in the episode. The noises that the Game of Thrones dragons made were modeled after large cat animals that purr. But number seven, Jerry's talking cat. You may have recognized that the talking cat that Jerry goes to Florida with is voiced by Matthew Broderick himself, but the cat itself was mostly their B story, and they said that he was created to be this metaphor for the voice inside the writer's heads in real life, overthinking problems, so that's why the cat kept telling Jerry not to overthink things. It was the writers speaking to themselves in a meta way through the script. Because of the way they ended that story too, it also may have been a reference to the parody cartoon dark version of Garfield about the cat that stalks its owner called I Am Sorry John. Number six, Rick wants to slay the dragon. He breaks the fourth wall when he says that this is the end of the Morty Gets a Dragon episode because he knows that they're inside a fictional TV show. But the TV show within the TV show that Rick and Summer are watching and making fun of called Ass is just a parody of Bones in real life. The story of the Ass show and everything that they say about it, the characters, is basically directly ripped off of the Bones TV show in real life with the two characters getting together. Oh, it's boring. No, I don't want to watch it anymore. Rick then references Drag Race when he says, I always slay Queen. In number five, Rick versus the dragon and his giant treasure hoard of Easter eggs. Rick goes down and makes fun of all kinds of dragon tropes. Oh, if only I wouldn't have planned for the only thing the dragons are known for, breathing fire. Usually every time an episode is based on a lot of really overt tropey things, he starts calling them out in an episode. He spent the entire episode making fun of magic. When you look at all the treasure that he has in the background, there's the Venus de Milo statue. I'm assuming it's an original because he has so much unique stuff in that hoard. He also has what looks like a Tesla car or some kind of sports car. A classic Ghostbusters high C ecto cooler, which I myself actually drank a ton of as a little kid. He's also got an Action Comics number one, the first appearance of Superman, a Dan Harmon Funko Pop, a classic Duckman animated series lunchbox, small soldier spin pops, which they directly call out, and then Future's self titled album on vinyl, signed in Molly and Percocet. There's a bunch of other stuff in the background that they don't really spend a lot of time on or is cut off in frame, so if you spotted any other easter eggs in the dragon's treasure hoard, just write them below in the comments. But then number four, Rick and the Dragon Party. Turns out dragons really like to party and they're super polyamorous. They partake in volcanic fumes, which may or may not mess with Rick's higher brain function. Who cares? He doesn't mind. They play the song from the album that they just referenced when they're flying around just getting wasted together. They make fun of Taylor Swift when they ignore Morty's call, sending him the gif of her pumping her fist. Summer explains that that means you're lame, Morty. The speech that the dragon then gives to Rick is actually meant to be true, meant to be taken seriously. There will be sayings about you, your lessers will hunt you down, and you are one of a dying breed. Literally because Ricks get killed all the time, but also evil Morty is probably going to come for C-137 Rick eventually. Because the episode is all about bad relationships, toxic relationships, they execute their soul bond. Morty watches them. Rick gets really weird about it. Then the wizard comes back and starts slut shaming the dragon. So number three, Rick, Morty, and Summer go to rescue the dragon from the wizard. Rick gets really pissed off because the laws of physics are completely whack and magic is the only thing that works in this realm. Science won't help him. We learn it takes 78 years to actually hang a dragon. They get kind of steampunky with the weapon that Rick picks up, but the weapon itself works a lot like the impossibility drive from Hitchhiker's Guide, turning things into random objects when he shoots them. Rick continues to make fun of magic because it seemingly has no rules. Why be worried about anything when it doesn't make any sense? Summer even tries to shoot an arrow out of her butt before she accidentally hurts Rick by shooting the dragon in the eye. When the wizard stomps out too, if you look in the background, you can kind of see him like he's been Skyping with some scantily clad sorceress in the background. We meet the other slut dragons, some of which are so weird and creepy that the other regular slut dragons don't want to have anything to do with them. Yet they all wind up in that creepy group soul bond with the creepiest, oldest, grossest dragon called Shadow Chucker. He seems like something out of the bowels of some creepy Tumblr fanfiction in his staff that he carries around, which Rick doesn't notice right away. Oh, I just saw what the staff is. But they force themselves into that group soul bond. They defeat the wizard. It's actually some beautiful animation, even though when you think about what's actually happening in this scene, it's kind of gross. 
They defeat the wizard who somehow makes his suffering worse by freezing himself before the dragon roasts him alive. Just more Harmon Town, Harmon Quest jokes. Rick makes fun of the wizard's magical portals because who writes on portals? And then things get super awkward when Liam Cunningham's dragon follows them home, hoping to continue their weird toxic relationship. First with Rick, who then leaves to help Jerry, which tells you how badly Rick wants out of this situation. Then Morty, who just repeatedly has to tell him to leave because the dragon starts to embarrass himself. Rick also breaks the fourth wall again when he says that there's a real big season finale situation with Jerry that he has to help out with. Then blame everything that happened in this episode on Morty because he's the one that wanted a dragon so bad. But number two WTF, Jerry's mind blowers. Rick goes to pick up Jerry at the airport with a talking cat. They find out why the cat can talk. It turns out it's so horrific that Rick has to erase Jerry's mind. You're not really meant to understand why the cat can talk. Remember, the whole point of the cat storyline is just the writers not overthinking things. Sometimes something weird happens in an episode for strange reasons, and it's not meant to make a lot of sense. In number one WTF, the post credit scene. With the dragon homeless dragging his treasure hoard down the street, the random dude tries to pick him up for money until the talking cat, Matthew Broderick, comes back to start a relationship with it and get him to fly him back to Florida. How long does it take a dragon to fly to Florida? Let me know in the comments if you spotted any big Easter eggs in the episode that I didn't mention in the video. Like I said, big Dungeons and Dragons episode of Rick and Morty. Overall, I liked it a little bit better than last week's episode, but it was way, way grosser. There'll be a new Crisis on Infinite Earths episode tonight. Tom Welling from Smallville is going to be cameoing along with Kevin Conroy's Batman from Batman the Animated Series. There's a whole bunch of other stuff, so as long as you have alerts enabled for my channel, you'll see all the videos when I post them. But click here to rewatch the Wonder Woman 1984 trailer a billion more times and click here for my Rick and Morty season four episode three video. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.